This chair was not designed to be sat in. It was designed to generate sound in a very pleasant way. And even then, I very rarely get to use it for that purpose because I live with old people. Um, I put out this tweet in the hopes that people would come and watch the show, and instead I'm getting 30 notifications a minute about how fuckable that cartoon rabbit is and how wrong I am for not trying to figure out how to solve science's real problem, which is that they can't get their dick into a waifu that isn't real. Um... Never mind that right now. So, let's talk about what I'm doing here. I'm going to make a series out of reading this book, basically. Because I'm not reading it, and I need to do that. <laughs> so, if I oblige myself to read it live on stream and have plus, possibly have conversations with people about it that may or may not be involved in said stream, which I don't know how that's happening. Um, let's see here. I'm thinking I should get into a Discord in case anybody tries to join me, but I don't know which Discord I'd, I would be doing that in, and I'm not confident that the people joining me would be anything but annoying. Uh, I'll do this anyway. I'll just be generally in stream voice, and if something comes of it, something comes of it. Anyway, uh, so for anybody who might somehow find the material that comes of this live stream and uh, don't know who I am, um, I am Aaron Lampe, a sociologist and philosopher um, educated at Boise State University. Uh, currently, I am working on a... Um, I'm working on a thesis to do with um, the phenomenology of otherness, which is a, a huge project on a much bigger scale than I imagined it would be when I first started it. So now I'm trying to figure out how to deal with that. I'm drawing credits from it at the university, so there's work I need to do on it. And a lot of the work is in where philosophy and sociology come together. And that happens to be the wheelhouse of a uh, theorist by the name of Thomas Luckman. Um, a uh, late German, Austrian, American theorist uh, born in the late 20s. So this is a collection of things that Thomas Luckman picked to put together into a book about the bridge between social sciences and uh, phenomenology as a as a field of philosophy. Um, and that is mostly what I am doing in the project that I'm working on. So this book could be very useful. Uh, well, collection of collection of papers, frankly, because that that's what this is. These are these are like journal articles and such from you know, um, uh, going all the way back to Mead and then up through, I think, like the 70s. I think this was originally printed in the 70s. Um, so that's neat in and of itself. It's like Herbert Marcuse is in here. Um, uh, I don't even know who Herman Lube is, but they're in here. Um, Aaron Greenwich. Um, I like Schutz. Um, Schutz is in here. Alfred Schutz. Um, Luckman's own paper here. Um, Benito Luckman. Um, Burkhardt Holzner. So yeah, there's a lot of there's a lot of big names in here, and some that um, some that we don't hear very often. Also, uh, the history of the book itself is is interesting. I, I don't know a lot about it, but I do. I am currently working under the um, assumption that they are there weren't very many of these made um, I think there was probably a single printing of it 
um, in the 70s or maybe a printing in the late 70s and then one in the early 80s or something like that because um, it's a very difficult book to find and because of a, a variety of um, shenanigans in which I engaged I through I was going to say no faults of my own mm, through a great deal of fault of my own I'm sorry to say uh, but uh, inadvertently I wound up owner of probably probably a sizable um, percentage of existing copies of this book, or at least um, a sizable portion of available copies of this book. Uh, so I have, I think, three copies out of the like five or so that were on the market when I was looking. Uh, so that's sort of an interesting point in and of itself. Uh, it's kind of a rare, it's kind of a rare book. Right, and I am collecting it. Apparently, I did not mean to become a rare book collector, but here I am. Um, so I'm not sure. I I don't know if it would be responsible to get into it today. Um, I guess this first one seems very short. Um. I could, I could read the preface, I suppose. Um, but anyway, I I want to go through this entire book beginning to end. Um, and doing it on stream seems to be the only way that I can ensure that I will do so. Um, and on this day of the week, on um, Thursdays from now on, probably, and as much as it's possible, I will start a stream at... Five, somewhere between 5 p.m. and 6 p.m., probably 5.30 or so, for reasons. And then um, run that until about 7 o'clock. Uh, and that should be addressing uh, this book and its materials and possibly explaining um, throughout the course of reading something that is of particular note or importance um, or relationship to my other project or what have you. Um, so we'll see how that works out for me. <clears throat> Let's begin by reading the preface then. Um, the preface is by, I assume, Thomas Luckman, although it, most of the articles say at the bottom. And this one just says preface at the bottom. Um, yeah, Thomas Luckman. Okay, good. Just want to make sure of that. Um, maybe we can go over Thomas Luckman a little more. Um, uh, taught in Germany, uh, born in Yugoslavia, uh, philosophy and linguistics, um, married to another theorist, Benita, as we were talking about earlier, um, sociology of knowledge and religion. Um, and the philosophy of science. Uh, 1966, uh, co-authored Construction of Reality, Treatise on Sociology of Knowledge, um, with, uh, Berger, which is one of the pivotal works in my education, one of the most important things, um, references that I've encountered in my time is at Boise State and as a sociologist. So, um, is there anything else particular importance? Died of cancer at the age of 88, living in Austria. Uh, phenomenology, which is why we're working with it. Um, Worked under Alfred Schutz, uh, Modern Societies, Knowledge Communication. Uh, there's a, ooh, it has a theory of social action. I did not know that. That's important because that's, uh, like the theory of communicative action is, um, is a candidate for that and is, uh, Jürgen Habermas, who might be, the uh, doesn't look like it. Which actually comes as a surprise. I wonder why. Might have been an alternative to, 
to th that view to an extent that um, Luckman and and um, Habermas might have had some kind of um, animosity of some sort or other. Although it seems Luckman got started a little earlier. Um, but Habermas has been around for literally 100 years, so. Uh, let's see. Phenom reading now uh, the preface. Phenomenology as a philosophical foundation of modern social science and several recent examples of sociological analysis which builds on that foundation. This might well have served as an accurate heading for the volume of readings. The actual title, Phenomenology and Sociology, indicates less accurately the contents of the volume, but it has the advantage of being much shorter. <laughs> if the and between the terms is not taken as simply connective or additive, it does not misrepresent the nature of this collection of essays. It could perhaps convey that the relation between phenomenology and sociology is the problem to whose clarification the contributions are addressed. Many signs point to growing influence of phenomenology and social theory. The attained misunderstandings and confusion reflected the continued and unresolved tensions between philosophy and science. The real, as well as potential, enrichment of sociology by phenomenology nonetheless carries the promise of a reconciliation between these two modes of human knowledge that were separated in recent history. Phenomenology, as it was developed by Edmund Husserl, from beginnings made by Bernanto's psychology in 19th century Germany, but having no direct relationship to the phenomenology of Hegel, as a child of the 20th century. This impact on modern philosophy is comparable to the consequences of Cartesian and Kantian thought on the philosophy of earlier centuries. In a striking parallel with the success of its predecessors, Husserl's phenomenology was not merely a new system, but a new philosophy, based on a radical shift in perspective and the establishment of a rigorous method of philosophical investigation. Its great significance for the social sciences can be attributed mainly in two facts. The new perspective illuminated the human world, and the method was applied successfully to the detailed description of human experience. Now, that's a very important statement that's made there, and one that would probably be considered fighting words in most of the circles that I've worked in. In a lot of critical theory... Um, and even just sort of continental philosophy in general, it seems to be that people see Husserl as ushering in the age of his student Heidegger, and that it was actually the work of Martin Heidegger that is important, and that Husserl's entire idea of trying to use a reductivist approach to philosophy was somehow doomed to failure on the grounds that philosophy had to be more important than reality. At least that's how that's how their that's how their claim sounds to me. Their claims to me sound like, well, our work is sort of more important than science because it's our work and that makes it more important to us. And because we are not scientifically minded people, we assume that the things that we think are important are more important than reality itself because it's our reality, even though it's not the reality that everybody else experiences and has no capital T truth necessarily in its operation, right? And even then, a lot of them are wrong about Heidegger anyway, so fuck them. Um, I don't have time to get into that. Uh, but basically, what I mean is that Husserl's scientist, scientism approach is about the w using the way that we um, have the those limits which we have on our empirical capacities as a way of seeing what the world around us can be be organized into as far as how we experience it empirically right so um one of the examples of this that's sort of different from what everybody else does is um if we ask ourselves what is a chopstick right okay so what is a chopstick one of the one of the only ways to answer the question of what is a chopstick is actually to figure out what a chopstick is not so what are the various things that we might think of when we think of the chopstick um the, the term chopstick itself might be culturally insensitive 
Um, that's an interesting thought. Is that built into what a what a chopstick is? And I might I might make the argument that if you're buying it in the United States, it almost certainly has to be because there has to be this like boiled down tokenized version of the way that other cultures operate to be marketized into a thing that I have purchased, right? Um, if I want to own my metal chopsticks, which clearly I do. Um, and so we would have to reduce those things out of it, which it isn't, right? And in that case, we might even find that this chopstick is not authentically a chopstick as compared to one of actual um, Eastern design, which would probably be um, cheap and, and wood or bamboo or um, something disposable, frankly, um, compared to this weird stylized aluminum thing that's supposed to call to mind paintings of dragons and um, all these other things, which, while culturally indicative, are inauthentic and marketized. So um, you break things down in order to um, reduce them into a form, and that's scientific reductionism, a, 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 a variant of scientific reductionism that is producing our knowledge phenomenologically, right? As we, as subjects, experience the objects um, around us, um, the way that we encounter them, the way that we react to them, the way that we learn from them um, in this way. Uh, but most people are going to say that that whole process is only meaningful in that it sets up Heidegger so that Heidegger can come in and say that the experience of the individual is actually the universe experiencing itself through the individual and that the the view of subject is a um is a an illusion uh, that we have to figure out how to live with because we are the ones who are experiencing um but as interesting as that fact is it doesn't it doesn't change the fact that what um, Husserl is giving us is a um is a reductionist tool set um a branch of science as as he saw it and all these really important discoveries that heidegger makes afterward are basically psychological in nature um like what we would call collective unconscious or even in the moment unconsciousness when he talks about um, the ready to hand um not to say that those things aren't extremely important, but they're not so much tools as they are um, certain kinds of answers to questions that in a lot of ways psychology was already answering in, in similar or, or, or different ways, um, coming more or less to the same thing. We are not consciously aware of the various things that we are doing most of the time. That's, that's sort of a takeaway from that that is true in full circles. Um, whereas Husserl is deliberately working within this field of of trying to use um, empirical information. And I wonder what might have come of that. Like, was he just not doing anything anymore and hadn't been changing? Was at the end of the history of his of his theory? Um, or was it going to be something more like a Habermas, um, John Rawls thing, where they're going to spend the rest of their lives working on this one thing, constantly tweaking it? Or could it have been the beginning of a project not much unlike Heidegger's, but in a in a more um, specifically scientific direction, or even just expanding upon the reductionist toolkit in some way? If it hadn't been for the rise of the Nazis and um, Heidegger getting his job, who who can say? Um, but it would be interesting to see um, what the alternatives might have been. But I digress. Uh, despite the scientific rigor of its method and the vast program of phenomenological research inaugurated by Heidegger and continued by the following generations of phenomenologists, by Husserl, my mistake, and continued by the following generations of phenomenologists, phenomenology is not a science in the common understanding of the word. Its perspective is ecological. Egological. Uh, damn.
It resonates human experience in its place as a primary datum about the world, and it describes this experience by turning and returning to the intentional features of experience. The perspective of egoism science, for excellent historical reasons, is neither based on nor reflective as a mode of knowledge. Furthermore, the phenomenological method of attending to experiences precisely as they present themselves, i.e. as a structure of mainly layered intentions, is not and cannot be one of the conventional methods of social science. The phenomenological method is more radically descriptive than any method of an empirical science could conceivably be, or could ever want to become, um, because it has to be limited exclusively to what it is that we have gained through our experience. Um, you don't get to extrapolate upon that in order to claim knowledge of something, right? You have to live within um, Hegel's alienation between you and the object and sort of just live with the fact that you can't necessarily apply reason to that thing, although Kant would probably differ. Um, let's see. Uh, phenomenology places brackets on ontological claims, basically what I just met, what I just said, which are intrinsic traits out of everyday experience, and that the same at the same time describes the sources of these claims. It neutralizes as best as it can, without abandoning language as a recording device. For its descriptions, the heavy overlay of theory without which scientific as well as common sense facts are plainly unthinkable. It shows on what conscious activities such theories necessarily rest. Phenomenology describes the constitution of our experiences by recourse to the most direct evidence available. Its criteria or verification differ, however, from the use of the good purpose in the social sciences. In contrast, the epistemology, what? The epistemologically naive observations and measurements of more or less public events that we practice in the social sciences when we look for data, the data of phenomenology are of a more elementary nature. We find them by inspection of our own experiences by using the methods of phenomenological reduction. We process step by step from the historically, biographically, socially, and culturally concrete features of everyday experience to its elementary structures. This is a procedure that differs from the inductive generalizations of empirical science. Eventually, the results of inspection of and reduction can be communicated in a further step by step to fellow man. To fellowman. The fuck is a fellowman? Uh, it's like somebody in a fellowship? I don't know. To fellow men. With a hyphen. By recourse to evidence of the same kind on their part, they can be intersubjectively verified. But this is a different method of verification or corroboration from that used, in fact, or appealed to as an ideal in the social sciences. The goal of phenomenology is to describe the universal structures of subjective orientation to the world, not to explain the general features of the objective world. Now, um, the reason that's important is because when we think about, like, what the project that I'm doing is, um, when we think about the, the things that are happening in the world around us, that process is extremely referential and the information that we are applying to it comes from somewhere. Right. And so what we're doing when we're talking about this reduction is to say all that we can use here is description in some way of what we are encountering and nothing else. So um, I am encountering the, the shirt that I'm wearing uh, currently 
in that I can feel the fabric on my person. This is an empirical truth. I can see the imagery. This is an empirical truth. I also know an awful lot about this branding um, and about Boise State and the way that they manage this branding, which is different from their athletics group, which has a different form of branding, which is legally distinct from the university, despite taking funds from the same sources, meaning that essentially um, the people of the state of Idaho and the student body all pay an awful lot of money in order to give the athletic groups a way of generating income from selling licensing, uh, which is a very disturbing prospect. But none of that is viable currently because all of that requires information that is well outside of this reducible process. Um, all of that information would have to be applied in some other way. So when we're talking about how human beings interact with one another and um, otherness is generated on the phenomenological level, what we're saying is when a human being encounters another human being, something happens. And using this reductive mode of thought, I want to know what that something is. And I'm going to describe what that something is on that level. And then using a similar idea we can start to put the rest of these building blocks that we're talking about um, that lead to the understanding that there's a fundamental problem with Boise State's branding, for example. That all has to be able to come in piecemeal through a, an, an equally reduced process. The idea being that eventually we will know from, the, um, from what we can take away from the experience of the other as the... Um, object of the subjecthood of the experiencer in tandem right um up through a development of a society to where the building blocks for identity come from that tell the person who their self is versus who the other is and all this other stuff where all of this comes from where the baggage exists how it's applied um and then how the other is framed in their mind versus how the self is framed in their mind and these are the tools for doing that Okay, uh, the conservative opposition to this development, no, we are wrong. We haven't talked about sociology yet. Sociology is not much older than phenomenology. It is a recent, it is a relatively recent discipline and a group of sciences that are, despite a vulnerable pre, a venerable prehistory, which goes back at least as far as Aristotle, um, children of the modern age. Rational thought about human affairs is not an invention of our time, but formerly, formerly, social theory had to contend with religious monopolies on the interpretation of the world, especially, of course, of those sectors of the world that were politically sensitive, i.e. the polis and its affairs. From the Athens of Socrates, where the first systematic attempts were made and suppressed to employ reason in analyzing human conduct to medieval Islam and Christendom, this monopoly was only rarely relaxed, and it was never abandoned completely. Ever since the Renaissance in Europe, however, it was enforced less rigorously and less and less effectively. The slow but irreversible emancipation of physical science from religious control carried the promise that budding social sciences, too, would be allowed to mature without the side jacket of dog, the straitjacket of dogma. But the secularization of traditional social theory did not lead to a new social science in pursuit of understanding the social world as a human reality. As soon as social theory was tentatively freed from constraints of a traditional religious worldview, it was subjugated by a new cosmology. A Copernican, Galilean, Newtonian view of the world was adopted as the ultimate model for the scientific analysis of social reality. Um, so there's some problems with that, with these statements. Um, it's not to say that Luckman's like wrong, um, but there's some stuff in there that we need to take with a grain of salt because it involves a very specific series of declarations about history and the way that it had a tendency to be taught 
across Europe, which weren't necessarily true. Um, Lachman himself was probably well aware of the fact that there was a great deal of scientific and um, mathematical knowledge, which while probably by some argument or other, very much under that monopolistic yoke of Islam, um, they were still very much developing things that were uh, not themselves dependent upon religious belief and not necessarily connected in any way to religious belief um, or of the um, theocracies of, of Islam and caliphates. Uh, and a lot of what was happening, like Europe in its dark age um, after the fall of Rome, was, was backsliding in a lot of places and in a lot of ways. While in the Middle East, that was not happening, and they still had um, a lot of these unbroken chains of knowledge and information, and we're still working with them. So it's a little... Um, that's that's before we even get into the role that... It's still a hegemony, for sure, right? That the Catholic Church would still have been in charge with this monopolistic view of reality. Um, but they uh, funded most of the research um, that was going on. Most of the people who had enough education to be doing anything were um, trained by the church and were um, religious. Uh, so there's a, there's a certain thing we have to we have to acknowledge that um, this is using a certain view of that period of history that might not really be that accurate. There was a lot of stuff going on there um, that that was not scientific thinking being exclusive to, to church dogma. In fact, um, when they when he's talking about the Copernican, Galilean, Newtonian view, that's actually the sort of thing I mean, because it's not like the church provided the only dogmas that people felt the need to, to relate to, right? Like um, a lot of a lot of Judith Butler's gender trouble shows us that um, a lot of science was still operating very much in dogma. It was more or less based originally on the Bible, regardless of how many steps of um, uh, of removal there were between the scientific theories that were presented and, uh, and the problematic interpretations of ancient religious texts, um, because that there that chain itself was also unbroken and in many ways remains unbroken to this day, despite the um, observations of critical theorists. Uh, so even being critical of things in and of itself is something that is a lens of which we must be critical, right? And this is this is something we have to think about here. Uh, continuing on, though, the conservative opposition to this development retreated in disorder. It took refuge in romantically regressive forms of academically established but intellectually ineffectual political and social philosophy. The secularization of social theory thus resulted in a split between philosophical and scientific approaches to the knowledge of man and society. Um, Dave, uh, Theory Plebe, uh, not long ago pointed out that something like this was going on and that you can see the split between analytic and um, continental philosophy as a split between scientific and philosophical thinking. And I'm not sure that that's really, I mean, Again, I, I can't say that it's wrong. Um, I'm not sure that it's adequately accurate. You know, it, it might be vacuum truth, but nonetheless, there's something to be said about that. Um, it fails to prevent the return of Diex Machinus. Uh, uh, is that just Diex Machina plural? You have to change the version of De to Dea in order for Machinus to be... I don't, I don't know anything about Latin. Into the world of human affairs through the new gods, although the new gods were no longer personal ones, the modern social sciences developed in continuous danger of either forgetting the barely discovered humanity of the subject matter or of defining it as a trivial epiphenomenon of a truer reality. Um, the controversies between religious, philosophical, and scientific approaches to study of man lasted well into the 20th century and were exacerbated by the infusion of totalitarian ideologies into jurisdictional struggles among intellectuals. A giant step toward a clarification of the issues was taken by Max Weber 
over half a century ago. He viewed sociology as a science explaining human behavior in society, but all explanations presupposed interpretations of human actions. These were to be based on a historical typographical account of the subjective meaning of action. Weber gave methodological recognition to the human constitution of the subject matter of the social sciences. Thereby, he mediated between the positivism of scientific and idealistic historicism of the humanistic disciplines. In the context of American social thought and social behaviorism of George Herbert Mead and the sociogenetic account of the human mind played an analogous part to mediating between the behavioristic sociology of the time and the philosophy of pragmatism. Neither Max Faber nor Mead was a phenomenologist. Avant a pair a la tire. Some French stuff happens, but their thought played an important part in preventing a lapse of sociology into total reductionism. They prepared the ground for a reorientation of social theory whose philosophical inspiration was Husserl's phenomenology. Um, I did not know that. I did not think that there was going to be a direct connection between Mead and Husserl, or at least one that direct, um, if indirect. Uh, positivism. Okay, so this is important. Positivism is the idea that something can be uh, measured in a mathematical sense, or it doesn't matter. Um, and that all things that cannot be measured in this way are not only unimportant, um, but can be reduced out of various equations of reality. So what, how will we know what's going on in our world? Um, we can measure it. So what is the value of human life? Approximately uh, $150,000, depending on your insurance policy. That's, that's the only truth positivism can allow. Um, humanity cannot have a value, life cannot have a value, unless that value is quantifiable in a way where somebody can show you um, concretely in the material world how. Um, something is valuable and what that value is. And so uh, in that way, it's like, well, what is the best way to succeed? Um, the extermination of every man, woman, and child on earth. All right, do that. And then that's fine because the numbers say it. And that's what you should do. Um, and the idea that there's any kind of, you know, that there's any kind of ephemeral reality to that, like there is for all human experience. <laughs> all human experience has ephemeral factors, um, b beyond ephemeral factors. Um, a lot of things that simply cannot be calculated. And so uh, positivism, which is, is still kind of an issue with the way that, we, for example, um, people try to use uh, statistics to deal in human behavior to the exclusion of understanding humans or their behavior. The idea being that the numbers themselves show things. Um, there's a... Uh, comic that somebody shared with me recently one of the um one of the academics comic series um whatever it's called i can't remember what it is um in which a um an economist goes in uh, to a restaurant and orders and what they are given is the average order a person would make rather than what they ordered and they're told that because this is the way that behaviors will tend to function toward equilibrium, this is what you obtain regardless of what you ask for. And um, if, they're, if the theories of the modern economist um, were held true, then that would be what would happen. Uh, but it's not what happens. So modern economics has some explaining to do. And has had explaining to do um, since the death of um, um, John Maynard Keynes. But... Oh, well, um, they still get all of our funding. So there's that. I've made myself sad. Phenomenology appeared as the most stable candidate for the philosophical foundation of social science that was willing to define its domain as that of a human action of experience. And its goal is the rational and systemic understanding of the domain. By laying bare the universal structures of subjective orientation to the world, phenomenology could provide a general matrix of terms for casual, functional, or, for that matter, dialectical analysis 
of typical human actions or the consequences for concrete, i.e. historical, societies. The social sciences face a basic theoretical and methodological problem. The human world, whatever else it may be, is a man-experienced world and is in part man-made. The objective features of historical social realities rest in some fashion on universal structures of subjective orientation in the world, but precisely how they rest on them and what precisely these structures are seem to be questions that an empirical science is not equipped to answer. Those questions may be taken as a point of articulation between phenomenology and social theory. I don't understand that. Historical social r realities in some of the... Huh. There can be little doubt that the connection between phenomenology and sociology is truly paradigmatic for the present generation of social scientists. Happily or not, in the contemporary state of widespread intellectual disorientation, it is more it is of more than academic interest. In a secularized world, the separation of philosophy and social science contributes heavily to the cosmological uncertainties and confusion created by the definitive emancipation of philosophy and science from religious dogma. Philosophy and science are modes of human knowledge that spring from the same source, which is something I've often said. They attempt to give answers to the question how a reasonable orientation is possible in a world whose reasonableness is no longer guaranteed by extra human forces. In fact, never was. <laughs> you were all under a lot of false impressions. The differences in perspective, cognitive style, and method between these two modes of knowledge should not be confounded. One is based on personal reflection and subjective, intersubjective evidence. The other on impersonal investigation and public evidence. But unless these modes of knowledge overcome their radical alienation from each other, they will fail to fulfill their common cosmological function. Um, inevitably, that's true. Because the issue is, if you wind up with these dogmas we're talking about, right, um, then you have to have a uh, universe to which the um, things are applied regardless of whether or not they're true. That's inevitable. But also, on the other side, how will you know the dogmas unless you have the tools to be critical of your sources, right? So you have to be able to critique the positivist. You have to be able to say there is no depth of knowledge in your understanding. Your um, discovery of the correlation between ice cream sales and murder does not imply the causation of ice creams leading to murder, um, right? You need, you need qualitative thought for that. You need to be able to investigate logically and meaningfully uh, what you have to deal with here. Um, I am going to reach over here and grab a can of Arrowhead water. Probably. We are reasonably close to the end. Well, it's at the Luckman volume. The, uh, the preface. Um, we're not going to finish this book for maybe a year and a half at this rate, probably. I mean, it's not long, but um, it'll probably only be half of a reading a session if the um, if my past. Um, is any indicator. Be that as it may, the degree to which the contributions collected in this volume illuminated from various points of view the relation between methods, the goals and the domains of phenomenology and sociology was an important creation what? was an important criterion for their selection. It's a little dark in here. I should have turned the lights on. Um, I'm a legally blind man trying to read a book in the dark. 
It was the main uh, criterion for their inclusion in the first part of the volume. The physical scientist, psychologist, and philosopher Aaron Gerswich and the philosophers Maurice Marleau-Ponty and Alphonse de Willens and other scholars working in the period between the 30s and 60s continued to work the work of Husserl in a critique of empiricist psychology and in, a reconstruct, in reconstructing the philosophical foundations of social science. The biologist philosopher Helmuth Plesner, who with Max Schuller became one of the founding fathers of the modern philosophical anthropology, followed an independent but often parallel path. It is, however, undoubtedly the lawyer economist Alfred Schutz, yes, my boy, um, the student of Max Weber and Edmund Husserl, and a friend of Aaron Gerswich, who is the central figure in the phenomenological reorientation of social theory. The direct influence of his work on sociology in the United States, the European continent, and recently Great Britain is considerable. Furthermore, the thought of Schutz influenced Harold Garfinkel. Yeah, I fucking love Garfinkel. Um, and Aaron uh, Susserl. Sucoral? Aaron Suckerl. Sickerl. And is thus one of the sources of what came to be known as ethnomethodology. Yes! <laughs> I do a lot of ethnomethodological approaches um, to sort of undermine um, the normative states that people are in during ethnography. you got to breach that habitus if you want answers. His teachings at the New School for Social Research in New York City, decisively in sociology, what? decisively influence a whole generation of students of philosophy and sociology, which included, among others, Maurice Natanson, former Natanson in the former, and Peter Berger in the latter field. Um, the Berger of the Berger and Luckman project, um, the social construction of reality. Schutz, whose thought synthesizes and continues the key concerns of Edmund Husserl, Max Weber, and George Mead in a highly original manner, was little known outside of a narrow circle of scholars during his lifetime, but has now become a major influence on modern social theory. His impact is now felt not only in the most varied investigations of the theory of social action, in the sociology of knowledge and other sociological fields, but also for outside sociology, for political science and literary theory. I didn't know he'd been applied to literary theory. I'd be interested to see how people did that. Um, but in the film, in the field of political science, I've I've done that too myself, because there's a lot of stuff where Schutz effectively updates Kant in how we want to have a functional democratic society. And living through the age of World War II and studying the rise of fascism, he can explain exactly how that does not happen. <laughs> and says, okay, this is probably the kind of thing we're looking for. And then if you look at that in my work, you can see how that is not what colleges are doing for the people that the colleges educate in the United States. What, what colleges in the United States are doing when they educate people is actually to deliberately avoid that. Because to have what Schutz is talking about as a functional society is a problem for a certain kind of totalitarianist, which we don't consider to be totalitarianist. But it is to say normalized wealth culture and allowing power to trickle into the hands of the wealthiest people in the world um, is itself basically a form of totalitarianism, right? That the people who the, he who has the gold makes the rules. And Schutz is pointing out problems to that, that universities today really don't want people educated about because they would like the people with the gold to continue making the rules because they work very closely for, have a lot to do with, or in some cases are the people with all that gold. The interests are badly vested. To the extent which I find difficult to assess accurately, the editorial choices were influenced by my theoretical views. Obviously. So he's critical of himself in this sentence. Lovely. 
Instead of presenting my own positions in an introduction, I have chosen to keep the preface short, thankfully. But I have included in this volume an adapted version of an essay when, in which I deal directly with the relation between phenomenology and sociology. I'm looking forward to that. That's one of the ones that I meant to read a long time ago and never got around to. For very personal reasons, if nothing else, that one's going to be very important. The reader will be able to judge for himself whether my views are compatible with reasonable principles of selection or whether they are unduly distorted, have unduly distorted them. Um, it's one paper out of like two dozen, dude. I'm sure you're fine. Um, well, dozen and a half, maybe two dozen. Another consideration which influenced the selection was availability. Oh, God. <laughs> if you knew what I did to get my hands on one of these books, let alone all three copies, which I should not have, what have I become? Work in what become known as ethnomethodology. Huh? Another consideration which influenced the selection was availability. Period. Space. New sentence. Work in what became known as ethnomethodology, for example, led a subterranean existence for years, but recently so many collections of ethnomethodological writing were published and are easily available to the public that there seemed no purpose served in reprinting examples of it in this volume. Oh, that's the opposite of what I thought. So this is the rare shit. Fucking sweet. <laughs> <laughs> now some they don't feel so stupid for accidentally getting three copies of this book. Although spilling coffee on this one is still a blunder for which I have to take responsibility and be very, um, what's the word I'm looking for here? Hard on myself, I suppose. Similarly, some recent work in so-called phenomenological sociology found its way into print. Very much of the same can be said about symbolic interaction, ethnoscience, so-called cognitive anthropology, etc., whose real and acknowledged connections with phenomenology are much less direct than those of phenomenological sociology and ethnomethodology, but which are especially interesting as examples of an elective affinity between intellectual traditions of dissimilar origin. They increase the plausibility of the hope that the social sciences could well find a cogent philosophical foundation in phenomenology. A further factor governing inclusion and omission was my decision to use only original versions of published papers, unless the author was in a position to edit the paper themselves. With the exception of a few essays expressly written or adapted for this volume, excerpts from books were excluded. I did so for reasons which I consider good, but it must be admitted that this principle eliminated some important work from consideration. The interested reader should therefore give very serious consideration to the list of further readings at the end of the volume. I have a feeling that that's going to wind up... Oh, uh, yes. Uh, thus ends the preface. Yeah, Thomas Luck. Um, I have a feeling that that's going to be very much a article of its time. Um, that's going to be part of when the book was developed and written, and how things were done back then. Because, uh, of course, this is all before JSTOR and that kind of shit. Uh, in these days, um, the well, a lot of times, by the time somebody in the more or less general public were going to get their hands on, on um, academic theory, it was going to have to have gone through somebody that wanted a position to mass produce it, right? Uh, and there had to be a reason for doing that. Uh, it's still relatively innocent, I think, in the 70s. Uh, but that was the beginning of the neoliberal turn. So by the time we're talking about the, the late 90s, um, you're looking at figures like um, fucking um, uh, Steven Pinker and people like that. Um, psychologists, mostly, because they get the most funding to begin with. And then they sell books that are things that anybody can buy. And those books tell them that their view of the world is acceptable to have and then allow them to sort of avoid the repercussions of critical thought um, and actually harm society at large. 
while making the psychologists very wealthy. Um, and that's part of the, the whole neoliberal turn. But we can use that as a lesson, although that one's much more harsh. It's also much more stark to look back at what he's bitching about when he's talking about versions of it being rewritten for books that are going to be published. Because somebody's vested interest is somehow reflected in the rewrite. So he needs the original versions, right? Um, and even then, he's talking about the 70s, as I was saying. So it's probably much worse as things go later on. Um, there might be 45 minutes left. There's somebody in the chat. I don't know if they're particularly interested in what's happening right now. Um, but there could be other directions we could take this thing um, to go on talking about more information to do with Thomas Luckman personally. Um, perhaps um, talking more about Schutz or Garfinkel. I'm actually interested in their take on ethnomethodology because my understanding of ethnomethodology is admittedly somewhat simplistic. I bought um, the um, ethnomethodology book. Uh, but I've I've yet to read it, um, and even though I'm familiar with that approach through text textbooks and stuff, this connection that Luckman sees with it being like direct with phenomenology surprises me. Um, like, how is ethnomethodology more specifically in touch with that than say? ethnography as, a, as an approach or maybe it's because ethnomethodology at the time was was in a vogue um, he can he can say that right because he's saying that um, ethnomethodology is in a manner of speaking um, has this this principle which is because you can see the ethnomethodology specifically in the works of Garfinkel um, and say this is this thing. Whereas ethnography, ethnography is an approach. It's a tool and it's used in anthropology, sociology. It's used in fucking marketing. Um, communications research uses ethnography. Um, journalism is, is ethnography by and large. Um, a lot of journalists used to call themselves ethnographers at one time and ethnography ethnography in general at one time was was its own sort of approach to doing things so maybe that has something to do with it and again this if this was written in the uh, or put together originally in the, the mid 70s then uh, <laughs> um, back then ethnography could mean anything ethno methodology was very specific i think that's the answer to that question but otherwise there there being a direct link doesn't seem I don't see why ethnomethodology would, would, could be singled out as having a direct link to phenomenology, even though I've studied both. And that might even just be me, because I'm so, like, like being the fish in the water, right? I don't see the water because I'm doing this shit all the time. <laughs> and to me, it's just like, but it's completely different because of pairs that I've been splitting in my head for 10 years now. Who can say, 10 years? It has been 10 years. Um, 2013, um, seven years in seven years it'll be 10 years in 2023 wow hmm in 2023 i will have been specifically in sociology longer than i was in kitchens that's mind-blowing what are the implications of that phenomenologically speaking huh uh i can reduce that down to me being old through phenomenological reductionism i can say that aaron lampe is old <laughs> because of there's too many things that are 10 years or more. All right. Uh, there should be a list here of... Uh, Thomas Luckman wrote The Social Construction of Reality with uh, Peter Berger in 66. Invisible Religion, the next year. Uh, Sociology of Language in 75. Uh, Structures of the Life World in 82. In 82, Alfred Schutz was alive in 82? I thought Alfred Schutz died in, like, the fucking 60s. 1899 to 1959. Yeah, he died in, he died in 1959. He did not write this in 82. Uh, that requires some explanation. I think it's, it could possibly be that he and Alfred Schutz started working on it. Alfred Schutz passed away. He was very sad about it, and then after 10 or uh, 15 years of doing other projects and things started back up again 
and took over for Professor Schutz and then finished what they were doing. It's Schutz, actually, but I always pronounce it wrong because I am an American. and That's how we roll. Life, World, and Social Realities in 83. Uh, sociology of Language in 75. And then Theory of Social Action in 92. I would very much like to compare this theory of social action and the theory of communicative action in some comparison contrast and see what happens there. Um, because they're both about language. They're both about social action. And they both... Actually, I think communicative action came out considerably earlier. Um, but that that is a fascinating thought. All right, let's look at... Um, uh, Schutz, who I've talked about before, um, was uh, part of a lot of the other stuff I do too. It was a um, influenced Garfinkel and Berger. Um, let's see. Uh, Selected bibliography is enormous. Oh man. On multiple realities, philosophy and phenomenological research, Sartre's theory of the alter ego, philosophy and phenomenological research. There's loads of philosophy and phenomenological research. Loads. Um, then you get to the 50s. Um, he's writing for various journals. Uh, 66, he writes The Problem of Reality. Um, which includes studies in social theory and studies in phenomenology and philosophy. Um, phenomenology of the social world comes out in 67. Phenomenology and social relations in 1970. Skip ahead to 82, life forms and meaning structure. See, this is after he's dead. A lot of these are posthumous. I would say the majority of his works are posthumous. He died before 1962. So half of these half of these are published after he dies. That is weird. Man, Talcott Parsons is involved in this one. Nobody gives a shit about me. All my shit's just going to disappear when I'm dead. You can imagine having the majority of my work published after I kick it. Uh, oh, man. It's really interesting, though. Uh, so, this ground isn't terribly well covered. Right. Um, but I've introduced the topic. I've introduced the characters at play, so to speak. Um, the uh, other authors we're going to be visiting besides uh, Schutz and a lot of the people that I've never heard of um, are going to include Husserl himself. And one that's particularly windy, as I recall. Um, he uses a lot of verbiage that I was... That one could find easily confusing as I... As I as I remember. But I've read it a number of times now, so I should be fine with it. Um, Maurice Marleau-Ponte. Um, everybody likes Marleau-Ponte. Um, that one's super interesting. And O'Neill. Luckman, of course. Um, more Schutz. Um, Luckman's wife. Also Luckman. Um, Buckner, Keller. And his counterpart, Peter Berger. I thought I remember there being more. Oh God! What if there's? What if there are different applications in different versions of the book, and I have different versions because I have three? Fuck! I even have access to a fourth because when I started doing this, I was using the ones from Boise State Library. Those might have different authors, uh, papers that aren't included in this edition. That would mean that there had to be multiple editions of the book. I do not believe that that is the case. I believe that there was one edition made of the book. It was released 
and then it never reprinted. And that's the reason why it's so difficult to find and why it, in my stupidity, I managed to procure three of them. Um, wow. I don't know where to go from here as far as that goes, though. I cannot think of anything else that is required in order to um, uh, introduce the topic, and that is all this stream is really for. When I cut this down to you um, for YouTube, uh, truncating silences mostly, and, I don't know, maybe putting uh, some sound behind it. I might try that again. I got, I got fucking um, flagged for using Bach. Fucking some asshole thinks he can make a claim on Johann Sebastian Bach. Ridiculous. My, my headset's wearing out. The 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 um uh, stereo comes and goes on it too. It's really pathetic. I'm very pathetic. Everything I own is bad. My life is trash, and my streams reflect that if one pays attention. Um, one of the most important. Um, things I've ever done was a lecture with Theory Plead that I've cut into episodes on my channel in which my chair breaks during our discussion. <laughs> and, I, and it nearly dumps me on the floor. <laughs> this is my life. This is my life. All right. Uh, I think that I'm going to call it early. Um, I'm 30 minutes ahead of schedule and nobody's watching, so that this is not raid worthy. Even if there was anybody to raid, it doesn't look like there is. Um, so I think I'm just going to click the in-stream button. Uh, anyway, chat, uh, I'll see.